Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 27th Annual National Presidential uh, Apology for the United States Public Health Service Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male at Tuskegee and Macon uh, County. This afternoon, we are privileged to have as our mistress of ceremonies, Dr. Kimberly Carr Buford. And I will be more than, I'm now more than happy to turn the program over to our beautiful young descendant, Dr. Kimberly Buford. Dr. Buford. Thank you so much, President Head. If you may, will you please put back up the itinerary of the program and I'll just give a rundown. We'll go from there. Did you ask for Shanta oh, to bring yeah. it up? Oh, so Shante, everyone, so Shante, thank Ali you for coming to um, the this program. afternoon's 27th annual commemoration of the 1997 National Presidential Apology that was um, spoken by uh, President Bill Clinton on May 16th, 1997, the East Room of the White House. Today's theme is moving forward from shame and trauma to honor and triumph together. I am Dr. Kimberly Buford, and I am the mistress of ceremony as well as a descendant and scholarship co-chair. We have a very special program today with awesome speakers, um, beginning with our invocation with Mr. Clement Jules, who's also the descendant and my cousin and acting treasurer, as well as a welcome from Ms. Lily Head and descendant um, and the president. We will also have greetings brought to us by Attorney Crystal James from the Vice President of External Affairs and General Counsel, the Special Assistant to the President for Equity Programs at Tuskegee University. We will also bring have gre greetings from by Mr. Dr. David Hodge, who is the Interim Director of the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare. And he's also an associate pastor, pastor and lead ethicist at Tuskegee. Later, we will have the glorious voice of Mr. Glenn Person, who I will introduce briefly. He's also an educator and a former member of the Tuskegee University Golden Voices. I will also introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, um, Dr. Jacqueline Brooks, who's uh, also a descendant. How awesome is that we have descendants in these high places? And she is the assessment and field placement coordinator at Tuskegee University, as well as the owner of YES, which is Youth Empowerment Solutions, LLC. Later, we will have the announcement of the 2024 scholarship winners by Bishop Deidre Parker Jackson and myself. And we'll also, after that, we'll have the annual memorial service by Bishop Parker Jackson and another beautiful rendition um, by Mr. Glenn Persons, our annual candlelight ceremonial ceremony where we honor the legacy of the 625 men. And that will be done by descendants and membership co-chair, Ms. Ibella Gaston Matt, Ms. Peggy Tatum, and Ms. Dalene Williams. And lastly, we'll have the benediction from Mr. Clement Jules. So we will follow the program in that um, order and I'll come in um, briefly to keep us moving forward just in case someone decides to look away or have a telephone call, I'll make sure to keep everyone in line. So next we will have our invocation by Mr. Clement Jules. Thank you. We're all bow our heads today, please. Lord God, we come today thanking you for giving us the opportunity to gather here today. Lord God, we come thanking you for providing the opportunity to meet, learn, and to grow. And as we begin to commemorate this apology of those 625 men 
who were unhumanly victimized by the United States public health system. We pray, Lord, that you will remind us that we still have work to do. Father God, we pray for the presenters today, the attendees and volunteers who made this program possible. We ask that you would be with them, that you would open our eyes and our hearts, our ears, that we would be able to take in what it is that they have to present to us today. And Father, in your words, as stated in Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Now, Father, we thank you. We ask that you come in, be a part of this meeting, and we pray that everything that we do will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Good morning, everyone. Next, we'll have our welcome by President Lily Hill. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of Voices for Our Father's Legacy Foundations, Board of Directors and Descendants, it is with much pride and joy that I welcome you to this momentous event. Thank you, Dr. Buford, for being our gracious mistress of ceremony. Thank you and congratulations to Dr. Hodge for another spirited, educational, and inspiring public health intensive the past three days. And thanks to our esteemed keynote speaker, Dr. Brooks. And of course, Mr. Glenn Person, our soloist. I cannot thank the descendants who are participating on this program today for their dedicated service uh, to the foundation. Welcome to an annual event that remembers and honors the legacies of 625 African-American men who were immorally abused and unethically treated medically because of their race and social status. They were caring and loving human beings. These were our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, uncles, cousins, neighbors, and citizens because of their unnecessary suffering and sacrifices, we, their descendants, and the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University commemorates the 1997 National Presidential Apology for the United States Public Health Service Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male at Tuskegee and Macon County, Alabama for 40 years, 1932 to 1972. And as we reflect today on the meaning of the historical apology, we celebrate the lives of our forefathers. Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation was organized in 2014 by descendants to move forward on a journey of healing from trauma and shame caused by the study to an awesome place of honor and triumph. Today, we are passionately working to dismantle medical racism, foster education, social justice, and public health. For our fathers' voices are finally being heard. We have been blessed by the favors of, the, of Almighty God with his amazing graces. And now we have partnered 
with California Association of African American Superintendents and Administrators, Millbank Memorial Fund, National Institute of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Centers for Disease Control and Control Foundation, and the Meharry Medical College. We are no longer alone seeking unanswered questions about the study and are working toward health equity for the African-American community and all those that are marginalized. Because of our partnership, the theme as has been mentioned by Dr. Buford for this year's event is moving forward from shame and trauma to honor and triumph together. Join us in our efforts for change, change that will dismantle medical and social racism. Thank you all and welcome to this wonderful program. Thank you so much, President Ted, for that welcome. Next, we will have greetings brought to us by Attorney Crystal James. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings on behalf of our ninth president, Dr. Charlotte P. Morris, on this 27th commemoration of the Presidential Apology for the United States Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male at Tuskegee. Your theme today or this week, Partners in Healing, Moving from Shame and Trauma to Honor and Triumph Together, is in alignment with the President's focus on One Tuskegee, which emphasizes the partnership between community, university, and our federal partners who were all instrumental in securing the Presidential Apology and the continued growth and development of the National Center for Bioethics on our campus. I would be remiss if I did not also mention as a public health attorney that one of the most enduring legacies of the sacrifices made um, for our research is that now research that is conducted in the United States is not, is only is required to have monitoring from institutional review boards, that's IRBs, that are charged with ensuring this type of atrocity does not happen again. I am honored to partner with Dr. Hodge to ensure that the Tuskegee University and the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare um, continue to lead the way in this critical area. Thank you all for what you continue to do individually and collectively to ensure the sacrifices are never forgotten. Um, good luck for a great um, program today and I look forward to hearing the words from Dr. Brooks. Next, we will have greetings from Dr. Hodge, and I echo President Head's sentiments of having a very powerful public health ethics intensive. It's the 13th one, where we talk about the social determinants of health, we talked about Black bioethics, something that I learned, as well as AI. So Dr. Hodge, thank you so much for a very intellectual and stimulating conversation. Dr. Hodge, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Carr. Thank you, Dr. Carr Buford. Amen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Attorney James, BP James. Thank you very much, President, President Head, and the, the rest of you, our mother and father's children. I want to again bring you greetings from Dr. Charlotte Morris, the president of Tuskegee University, and her continued effort to make sure that the 16 and 25 men and their descendant family members, as well as their family members at the time, are not forgotten. Their legacy is the legacy, as Ms. Head so nicely pointed out, began as shame, but it has moved to triumph. Because when we look at the the people and the responses that we get, we get responses from around the world. Yesterday, we after the presentation yesterday, we were fielding questions and calls from the UK. So we continue to reach because of 16 and 25 men, because of your father, your grandfather, your uncle, and our sons, our their sons. 
we were able to we are able to reach the least the lost and the left out around the world. So we're excited about that. This year's this year's uh, conversation, as Dr. Carr just mentioned, had to do with AI, Black bioethics, empathy and care, and policy. The whole idea. Think about this: the sacrifice of these men are shifting and going to shift and increase and change policies for people who never met not one of those men. And these, as a matter of fact, people who have never met or even heard of Lily Head, who have heard of, 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 of Joyce Christian, who have never heard of my brother Jukes, who ever heard none of, of, of you or us, who never heard of Dr. Ruben Warren. But our, our, the work we do is going to impact their life and it's impacting their lives even as we speak around the world. So next year, you just pray for us, y'all, because next year we are um we've already discussed this with last year that this year was kind of our test come back to campus. We probably enrolled more people than we've ever done. Um with like 160 people enrolled um uh, above. And therefore, and, and not to mention the participation level. So next year is time, Sister Lily Head, for us to focus on bringing this thing back to the campus. Is one thing to have it on hybrid, I mean, to have it online because it's really great. We could catch people in Africa. It could catch people in UK. However, when we do it as a hybrid, we'll still catch those people, and I get a chance to let Sister Lily Head hug me and kiss me on my cheek. So therefore. Mm -hmm. That is such an exciting thing because there's it's a difference when you're actually on campus and feeling the energy of the students, the momentum of the fa the faculty. It is just powerful. So we're gonna make we're gonna we're gonna shift now to getting back to campus. COVID will only shut you down for so long, and now it's time. Um. So 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 we may reach out to each and every one of you because we have a, a smaller staff. But if all of us do it together, I mean, look what we did this week. Look at all, all of us. Did. Look what we did. Um, it's been amazing and just a smaller a smaller team so we're going to get it done so next year we're looking forward to a hybrid presentation because of the nih our building is such that we can create our campus is such that we could house and create the atmosphere to do this kind of do this kind of work um i want to thank um once again mr norman hayes at the cdc as well as as the the new project the new project manager um, Dr. Yamir Pena for their support because they're the ones who give us the funding to continue these this kind of session with um with Voices for Our Fathers as well as Tuskegee University and the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare. And so we we want to always give them thanks and appreciation. We want to thank our colleagues at Harvard University Center for Bioethics, namely Dr. Lachlan Foro, who is a brother to us, um, Rebecca Brendel Weintraub. Um, Dr. Um, Bob Trug, Christine Mitchell. These are our team members at Harvard, as well as our team members and, 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 and friends over at Emory University, Paul Wolpe, John Benier, and Kathy Kinler, and those who are at Vanderbilt University, T.S. Harvey, Ted Tischler, Brianna, and Paz, Lemus Paz. So we want to thank all of those who continue to work with us so that we could have favorable incomes, um, outcomes. We want to thank those in Primer, um, the public responsibility in medicine and research. We work, we, we, we share so much stuff and so much information so we can get the word out. So that's why we continue to grow. Um, in, on November 17th to 20th, the Prima Conference will be held in Seattle, Washington, and we will be taking students there. And the students will become, we will be taken to Prima. Listen, this, this, this I'm, I get so excited because the students we're taking to Seattle, Washington are students who are supported by our grant from the CDC and our relationship with Primer. Now, you say, why is this important? Why are these relationships important? One of our students, um, Bianca Alcina, Al Al who is a descendant family member, who is a bioethics major, um, I mean, that was just minor and part of the bioethics honors program. She was accepted to Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics, where she'll be pursuing her master's in bioethics. This is the really, these are the relationships we're building. The, Sister Lily, these are, this is just the beginning. I mean, um, Freddie, Freddie Lee Tyson, come on. <laughs> when he told you this is your work, this is your work. This is something to be proud of. 
that we took we took what they would proverbially, proverbially, proverbially call lemons and we're making lemonade each and every day. So we want to thank each of you for your support. Now, I will be remiss if I don't thank Dr. Prakash, who came in at the last minute when someone fell out and brought along Dr. Coppinger. And they presented on AI and social media and they did a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous job. So if you were there to hear it and see some of this stuff, listen, ladies and gentlemen, um, both of them, but they, they, they show us the power of information and misinformation. We already know about misinformation, don't we? Because the 1625 meant that's what it was about, misinformation. And so we already, we, all, we already know about ethics, right? But we already know what, what was unethical. But now what if those, what if AI is giving us another opportunity to review what we know and to enforce what we know to decrease implicit bias so that it doesn't become explicit bias to the level that it becomes the same kind of harm and shame that Sister Lily were fighting against, right? Implicit bias could actually do it again from a, and is doing it again, from an AI standpoint, when black and brown men are being arrested because of facial recognition, same thing over again. So we have to come in and be forceful. The National Center must lead the charge to say that those that kind of technology should have some constraints and limitations if you're going to take a black man, a brown man, or black woman and stick them in jail because a, a, a AI said that that's the guy who did something when the person was home. Okay, so finally, um, now, now every time we talk, you see my face because right now God has blessed me to be in this position at the National Center. But behind me and working with me each and every day is Mr. Kevin Lee, who is a budget manager, is Belinda Thorpe, who is our everything manager. <laughs> Ms. Belinda Thorpe, she's there in every possible way to make sure we can move forward. And also this year, I know you all know Dr. Beverly Evo. She is basically, she's the conduit with the family. Dr. Evo, we had to bring Dr. Evo back and she did a marvelous job to ensure that we could come to this today. So we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of you who came along and celebrated with us each week. And the same way we began, on the same how we began on Monday, Sister Head, we are closing it out on Friday. And this is not, this closing out is like a graduation, right? We call it a commencement. It's the beginning of what is to come. Dr. Brooks, so good to see you again, again and again. And I look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much with Dr. Hodge for enlightening us with all of the information. And I look forward to returning as many of us look forward to turning to Mother Tuskegee for the annual commemoration and public health e ethics intensive. So there's a little um, amendment to the program. We will have uh, Mr. Glenn Persons um, render two songs later towards the end of the program. And there, that's when I will um, introduce him. So now I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, Descended scholar. She is a lot of things and you're about to hear and it is very inspiring. So now I will be introducing Dr. Jacqueline Brooks. Dr. Brooks is a career educational leader that has expanded her work into her own company, YES, with the tagline, YES, which is Your Empowerment Solutions, LLC, where community improvement is her focus. Our largest project included working with the Macon County Children's Policy County Book Mobile Mobile Initiative, where the majority of her efforts were in time. She also works in higher education at Tuskegee University and part-time as the executive coaching coordinator for school superintendent of Alabama. Dr. Brooks has an extensive background in K-12 education and organizational leadership. She has served as a teacher and leader in a large Florida school district with over 70,000 students and in two rural Alabama school districts, both with less than 3,000 students. She has gifted, has been a principal, curriculum specialist, prevention and su support coordinator, accountability coordinator, federal programs director, higher education faculty, a dissertation chair and a school superintendent. She served in the role of superintendent 
of education for Macon County Schools for more than a decade and retired and came to Tuskegee later. She retired January 1st, 2022. During her tenure, she moved the district from a failing status to all schools being clear and have all schools designated as passing upon her retirement despite the challenges of COVID-19. And I think that's right, Dr. Hodge. I see, I, exactly. If we can, if we could put up claps or hands because that's a blessing to get those students through, through COVID and her moving that needle. Dr. Brooks is the recipient of numerous honors to include being named Teacher of the Year for John F. Kennedy Middle School in 95, recognitions by the United Women's League, the Tuskegee Macon County chapter of NAACP, Chi Ed of Chi, Phi Incorporated, the Tuskegee University Bioethics Center, BABI, and Omega Psi Phi for outstanding service. In 2016, she was named one of Macon County's top women of influence by the Southeast Small Business Magazine. She was also appointed to two state boards by a former Alabama governor the Alabama State University Board of Trustees, she's a former trustee, and State of Alabama Department of Archives and History Local Government Records. In 2018, she has an expansive, expansive um, career. In 2018, she was designated as the State of Alabama's District Administrator of the Year by Council of Leaders in Alabama Schools, she currently holds seats on several boards, which include the Macon County Economic Development Authority, the Red Tail Scholarship Foundation, the Tuskegee Area Chamber of Commerce, the Tuskegee United Women's League, and the Alabama Archives Local Records Commission. Dr. Brooks has written and delivered more than 50 keynote addresses, speeches to include the 2014 Alabama State University Founders Day Convocation, and the 2018 Alabama Association of Professionals of Educational Leadership Annual Conference. She is a member and deaconess of Sweet Pilgrim Baptist Church, member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, the Tuskegee Orchid Club, and the National Sorority of Phi Delta Kappa Incorporated. She supports Tuskegee University, Alabama State University, Booker T. Washington, and Nova Silva High School Athletics. The history, the Tuskegee History Center, the St. Jude's Hospital, and the Susan G. Coleman Foundation for Breast Cancer Research as her charitable organizations. She has been married to her high school sweetheart, Terry Brooks, for 34 years, and they have one daughter, Cassidy, who I believe is also on this um, webinar presentation commemoration as well. And Ms. Cassie served as the 2024 Distinguished Young Woman of Macon County and who is starting college this fall. So I already know she's in good hands, so that deserves another hand clap to have another descendant in the fall. And we'll probably, Dr. Brooks, be nudging you to be on the scholarship committee <laughs> for Voices for Our Fathers. She also has one son, Nixon who is um, gifted in the state gifted program at Tuskegee Public, and he served as the 2023-2024 Mr. George Washington Carver Festival King. Dr. Brooks' model is bloom where you are planted, and her mantra is the power of one. Please, please, please welcome this highly esteemed descendant, scholar, all things titles of education, Dr. Jacqueline Brooks. Thank you. After inmate Jim Kennedy died last year at the Limestone Correctional Facility in Harvest, Alabama, his sister-in-law got a call, was pretty unusual, from an Alabama funeral home that was preparing his body for burial. The funeral home worker said to the sister, did y'all realize that he came to us without any organs in his body? Sarah Kennedy recalled not believing what she was hearing. The funeral worker said his liver, his heart, 
all of his major organs, they are gone. His brother Marvin said he had nothing in his body. Another inmate suffered a similar fate. Arthur Stapler was 85 when he died, several months after Kennedy Jr. He was at the Brookwood Baptist Medical Center in Birmingham, Alabama. He had been housed at Hamilton's Aged and Infirmed Center, which is also run by the Alabama Department of Corrections. It's like a horror movie that I can't wake up from, said Stapler's son, Billy, who learned about the missing organs after hiring a private pathologist to perform an autopsy on his father's body. It was only after contacting the University of Alabama at Birmingham, which is among the providers that conducts autopsies for the prison system, that Stapler's family received what they were told were his brain and heart and a plastic viscera bag. The lungs and some other internal organs came back in pieces, but not all were returned. Good afternoon to President Morris and her staff, along with Board of Trustee members, cabinet, faculty, staff, and students, foundation president, Lily Head, other foundation members, bioethics director Hodge, and other bioethics staff, descendants, and participants. The scenarios I shared with you may be shocking, but they may not be because we are descendants of or researchers of what we know can be horror when it comes to health in these United States. The scenarios I shared with you are real and they are not from the 18th, 19th or 20th century. They are from current times and were recently run on CNN and in other platforms and are actually the subject of active legislation here in Alabama. Yes, let me impress upon you. This is the 21st century. 50 years after the end of the study that my four parents were a part of. So this means that this day where we are commemorating the 27th National Presidential Apology of the United States Public Service Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male at Tuskegee and Macon County. The vision, the mission, and the work of the foundation is more important and more needed than ever. You heard a lot about me more than I thought you would from Dr. Buford and thank you, Dr. Buford. But I want you to know that I and everyone who is a descendant of the voices for our fathers, we are whispers, we're vocalists, we're echoers of what they survived. We stand on their shoulders and their legacy all 625. I did the math and I heard President Head do it earlier, 1932 to 1972. What a long time, almost a lifetime, 40 years of unethical treatment. We continue today to shine a spotlight on the atrocities of the study. And we give credence to our history, no matter how tragic it may be for what that history does. It lends itself to just what the foundation has done, just what those accomplishments that Dr. Hodge has talked about from all over the world have done. These lessons of trial and tragedy surely have turned into honor and triumph together. But the above scenarios that I shared with you show you that clearly there is more work to do. Whose voices do I echo? 
Well, both of my grandfathers, great grandfathers, and a lot of community members who grew up in a small place called Roba, Alabama, near the now closed South Macon High School, Macon County Training School. My maternal great-grandfather was Willie Bill Moore. No, he never had a regular job, but he was a career man. He was a farmer. He is most noted and remembered for his skills, which included raising hogs. He is very much noted for having a bird farm. And he had, and I can remember, because I had the pleasure of knowing him and being with him until I was 12 years old. He had the most remarkable cane peeling skills you would ever see. And he was an excellent knivesmith. He worked in the community co to construct both Cooper Chapel, AME Zion Church, and Dawson Baptist Church. I knew him, isn't that amazing? Yet he was born in 1895 and lived until 1979. My great-grandfather on the paternal side was Dean Austin, and he also helped to construct a place of workshop in the Armstrong community. And that original church, which no longer stands, was County Line AME Zion Church. In fact, it is where my mother, three of her brothers, and my maternal grandmother and grandfather are buried. He died from tuberculosis in 1969 and only had a chance to see me for about a year because I was born in 1968. He raised 11 children through four different wives, each of his wives having passed away at a very young age and was still curious as to why they did so. And one of the later interviews, it was quoted in some of the studies literature that Dean Austin had 35 acres of land, a three-room house, two mews, and four cows. He is remembered by his family as a great man. And he was so proud to have been a member of the study. He thought it was a great thing that he was helping the United States and he was helping the world. He wore his Sunday's best whenever he had to report to Frank's store in the community to load up, to come to town, as it was called, to participate. His offspring joined the military and still continues to have a presence all over the globe today fighting for our country. These men did not realize that they were selected to be guinea pigs and were the subject of a medical study without informed consent. Yet, they participated. And we say out of their tragedy comes triumph. We know that because of their tragedy, they became a voice to the entire world and shed light on health ethics. Today, as we continue to look at health ethics, we must also bring into play health equity. How is health equity affecting us in this 21st century. Let's talk about a few of the challenges that we see regarding health equity and think about how the foundation, the Bioethics Center, and each of us using my mantra, the power of one. How can we impact these challenges? How can we take these current tragedies injustices and turn them too into triumphs? What short-term goals can we identify? What long-term goals can we identify? How will we measure our success? How will we make the next generation better? And what challenges may still remain? When we think about health equity, some health equities and ethics or unethics for that matter, 
may be subtle. And one is as simple as, but very complex, disparaging comments by medical staff. In the news this week, a Texas woman says she remains distraught by comments she secretly recorded by hospital staff during her surgery. Comments about her body composition, comments about what they perceive to be her diet and exercise habits were made during her surgery. And you may say, well, if she was in surgery, how does she know? Because her doctor often verbally abused her, according to her, and said things that made her uncomfortable during her medical visits and appointments, she decided to place a hidden camera in the braids of her hair during surgery and was appalled at what she discovered when she viewed the video. She said it still causes her to cry to think that medical professionals, people who are highly trained and highly educated, hold such racist and unethical views about the persons that they treat. How is it then that you have the best health care that you need to receive if people are holding stereotypes about you during the treatment process? There are many examples of things like this all throughout the United States and world. Another is research in health disparities. If we were to look at the stats, and Dr. Hodge, you probably have the research, how much research is done around diagnosis and diseases for women, for black women, for black men, and for black children and infants. Is it proportionate? I think not. Much work to do. I've already mentioned the illicit organ trade and the missing organs. It is really a head shaker and unbelievable in this day and time. There is also not just disparaging comments, but stigma and discrimination by healthcare practitioners. Do they do and give you the very best? Do they give you the latest treatment? Do they prescribe you the best medicine? My brother-in-law, who is a graduate of Meharry Medical School, was in a conversation with me when he was reviewing the medications that I took for hypertension. When he read one of the labels, he was immediately alarmed. And he said, sis, who prescribed this for you? It was clonidine or clonidine. And I told him and he said, please stop taking it right away. And you need to change health prayer practitioners because as a black American, African-American woman, this medication is not in your best interest. And if you know of any other African-American women who are taking this same medication, please share my concerns with them. This is why we need students educated, going to medical school and in higher ed. So foundations, please keep up the scholarship work because we need our people in health care. Then we have attentiveness by medical staff. I chuckle when I think about this because it's almost too unbelievable to be true. But when I was 33, I had a doctor in Auburn, Alabama, and I was trying to describe my symptoms to him. And when I got dressed and was ready to leave, he had the door cracked to his office where he was transcribing his notes from his visit with me. And his description was, I was treating a 33 year old black female who is a hypochondriac who is exaggerating her medical symptoms. It was divine intervention that I was in that space and that place at that time to hear those comments. And I never mentioned them to him. I never confronted him. I didn't report him to any board. But again, I changed medical doctors. And I also recommended to anyone that I knew not to go to him. But to let me know that I was not 
completely crazy. The next doctor to who I went to said, those symptoms are very interesting. I think that you have picked up a very rare germ that you actually touched your eyeball with and it entered your body. And it was a relatively simple treatment with an antibiotic. But that doctor took the time and was attentive, whereas the previous doctor had not been. And then, of course, we can look at another area, which is healthcare access. Failure to expand Medicaid. Today, we have 10 states, Alabama included, that have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act to individuals who are most in need of health care. My grandmother would say, and this was Willie Moore's daughter, my great grandfather, common sense is not very common today because common sense would tell us in the 21st century, we should be giving better and greater access to health care, not less. And then there's the topic of universal health care. Reporter Scott Dillon said, universal health care remains an unrealized dream in the United States. Of course, in a few parts of the country, like Massachusetts, the dream has become closer to reality with the state initiatives that are being done there. And of course, in 2010, the year President Barack Obama signed his signature health care law, the number of uninsured Americans has now fallen from 46.5 million to 26 million today. That is a remarkable accomplishment, yet there are millions who are still without health care. So yes, more work must be done. We must get more triumphs in this area. Then we look, there's corporate greed. And you know that corporate greed is there by the amounts that we all pay for our medication. And the sad thing in this example is that the people who need the medicine the most are often unable to get it. We must make this a part of our mission. Of course, we have the Supreme Court's decisions on women's body rights. And while I am not a personal proponent of abortion, I am a proponent of personal health care decisions. So I simply say to us, the rollback of Roe versus Wade is a rollback for all health care. When rollbacks about health care rights start, when and where do they end? And I would like to share this health equity situation, lack of health care institutions. When we think about the study and the tragedy of the study, there's somewhat of an anomaly there. In 1972, in Tuskegee, Macon County, Alabama, we had two hospitals. We had the Macon County Hospital near Lake Tuskegee, and we had John Andrew Hospital where I and some of you on this call were born. Fast forward to today's date, April 19th, 2024. And I asked the question, how many hospitals do we have? And the answer, sadly, tragically, is zero. We have work to do. And this is occurring all across our country as rural health care is minimized and more people are disenfranchised. And finally, I will reemphasize access to higher education. There is a concerted effort for a reduction in minority higher education access to include a recent reduction of scholarships at some prestigious Ivy League schools. This, of course, will directly and indirectly 
impact the number of minority students who major in healthcare professions or who may attend medical school. Foundation work in this area will be paramount to ensuring that our kids can have access to higher education. So I commend the foundation for the work and echoing the voices for our fathers and making great strides and accomplishments. But I say, let us continue to analyze these current situations, confront them, project our impact on future situations and act in whatever meaningful ways we can. For each of us, I say to you, perform a simple act of self-care every day in honor of our fathers. Be intentional about planning for and attending to your health care, including the selection of your physicians, your surgeons, and your therapists. Take charge of your health care. Double check every statement, decision, and recommendation. Research and get more than one opinion, maybe more than two. And don't be afraid to challenge anyone at any level, including at the federal or national level. Our fathers certainly weren't afraid to lend their voices and it is because of them and their challenge that this apology was issued 27 years ago. I thank you for lending your ear to me this afternoon and I thank President Head for inviting me to speak. May God continue to circle the foundation with divine guidance and his omnipresence. Thank you. Wasn't that an awesome keynote speech? I mean, I get chills just thinking about it. And I want to give three takeaways. One, Dr. Hodge, we need her next year at the Public Health Ethics Intensive. She has so much history, especially coming from an educational background because she dropped a lot of information. I think that she will be awesome, uh, awesome addition to the Public Health Ethics Intensive um, given her background. So Dr. Brooks, I'm about to put you on a lot of things, which leads now to the scholarship. So um, Bishop um, Judah Jackson will talk about that later, but you gave the foundation a lot of charges and spoken like a true educator. She gave us goals, not only just goals, she gave us measurable goals. And that's very helpful because we need those type of thought processes on our scholarship committee, considering that as we grow and expand, we will to have and select quality candidates. So just like you said, where they can continue to promote the legacy of the foundation of the 625 men. So again, I'm giving a very open invitation at some point um, for you to join us with scholarship and also get out the word of the scholarship uh, for Voices for Our Fathers and also the CDC scholarship where Dr. Uh, Bishop Deirdre Jackson will also um, discuss. And the third takeaway was we have a lot that we still need to do. And she mentioned the closing of those, those hospitals and she's absolutely correct. When it comes to rural health, there's a county in Georgia, Hancock County. It is deemed as the blackest county in Georgia. If you look at the county health rankings, Hancock County of the 100, out of the 159 counties of Georgia, it is ranked last when it comes to health outcomes and health factors. So there are a lot of Macon County surrounding areas all over the United States. Next, we will have our uh, rendition by Mr. Glenn Person. I am going to briefly introduce him. Mr. Glenn Derek Person is a gospel music musician and minister of music using his God-given gifts in various denominations in the South Central Alabama area. He's a songwriter, worship workshop clinician and producer with several credits to his name. 
through various groups such as the Tuskegee Glee Club, the Alabama Gospel Choir, and the Ingrid Wood and the Wood Tribe Orchestra, he has graced many stages in the United States. He graduated from Tuskegee University with a degree of mathematics in 2010, and he was also a Golden Voices uh, member of the Vo Golden Voices Choir. In the summer of 2018, he was selected to participate with the Glory Gospel Singers, a group based out of the New England area on a 45 day concert through France. He is a member of several, several organizations, including Alpha by Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and he serves in several positions on the local, regional, and general organization levels. Mr. Persons, the floor is yours, and we look forward to hearing two songs from you and your beautiful voice. Good evening. I'm sorry, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much um, for working with my schedule. Um, as Dr. Brooks knows, I am currently <laughs> in the trenches with these wonderful seventh graders. So to you all work with me, that will be a um, just a great cause. Thank you so much. Some times you have to encourage yourself some times you have to speak victory during the test and no matter how you feel speak a word and you will be healed speak over yourself Encourage yourself in the Lord. Sometimes you have to speak a word over yourself. Depression is all around, but God is present help. Well, the enemy created walls, but remember, giants, they to fall. Speak over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Speak over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Ooh, ooh, speak over yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord. Oh, oh, Thank you so much, Mr. Person. We are ready for your second song. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow. To run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to love your and chase from afar, to try when your arms are too weary. To reach the unreachable star. This is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for the right without question or pause, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest, that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm late to my rest. And the world will be better for these. That's one man scorned and covered with scars. She'll stroll with this last ounce of courage to read. To reach, to reach the unreachable star. Thank you very much. Mr. Persons, thank you so much for those very heartfelt songs and for the <laughs> ones who have loved to see his beautiful face. We will work on that next year. But as right now, just feel the spirit and his words and how God moves through him. So if ever you want to see him, go to one of his concerts. But as of right now, thank you so much for that heart felt warm and much needed renditions and it was perfectly executed for this commemoration. Next, we will now have the announcing of the 2024 scholarship winners. We are so excited. Bishop and I, we worked very hard on selecting panelists, well, well panelists and the scholarship recipient. So, Bishop Jackson, I'm going to allow you to take the floor and I'll just be your wing woman. <laughs> hey, I'm asking that Ashanti shares the um, PowerPoint. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation 2024 scholarship recipients. Yes. Our first, one of our recipients is my daughter, B. Uncle Renee Alcina, Dr. Hodges, Dr. Uh, David Hodges, one of her mentors. He spoke about her earlier. She is a descendant of Andrew, <clears throat> uh, Andrew Swint and Virtus Pollard. Her grandmother, Joyce Pollard Williams, served as treasurer for Voices for Our Father's Legacy Foundation until she passed in 2020. 
Bianca will graduate this spring with a major in psychology and minor in bioethics from Tuskegee University. Under the leadership of Dr. David Hodge and the excellent recommendations that Ms. Lily Head and Dr. David Hodge gave Bianca and her lifelong experiences, experiences she will be attending Harvard University's medical school uh, in a math uh, um, pursuing a master's in the is bioethics program. Her scholarship, she uh, received $2,000 from the Voices for Our Father scholarship and $500 from the Neil Crutcher Mentoring Scholarship. Congratulations, Bianca Alcina. Cassidy Renee Austin Brooks is the daughter of Jacqueline Austin Brooks, who was our keynote speaker for today. Cassidy Renee Austin Brooks is a descendant of Willie Bill Moore and Dean Austin Sr. She is the reigning Macon County Distinguished Young Woman and will graduate this spring from Booker T. Washington High School, Tuskegee, Alabama. Cassidy plans to attend the University of South Alabama this fall and aspires to become an optometrist with her own practice in quality eye care. She received the Voices for Our Fathers Scholarship of $2,000. Cassidy, I believe, is on right now, and if she would like to say something briefly, she can. She can unmute herself and say something briefly or come back at the end and say something. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to thank you for the scholarship award. It means so much to me, and just thank you again. Okay. Our next recipient, Kia Buchanan. She is a descendant of John Buchanan and Washington Buchanan. She is currently a sophomore majoring in elementary education at Tuskegee University. Kia served as an ambassador at Enterprise State Community College and a staff member at her community's Boys and Girls Club. She plans to use her experience and degree to enrich the children's minds outside the classroom. She received the $2,000 Voices for Our Fathers Scholarship. Adara Guest. She is a descendant of Fonzie Mahone. She is currently enrolled in Paxson School for Advanced Studies in the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. She is a published author of a children's book called Summer Save Summer and she plans to, to major in accounting at the University of Florida in the fall and one day become a certified public accountant. She received the Voices for Our Father Scholarship of $2,000 and the scholarship that's named after my mom, the Joyce Pollock Williams Community Scholarship of $500. Congratulations. Jamira Patrick, is a descendant of Doc Murphy. She is an Auburn High School Tiger Ambassador and an active member of National Honor Society. Jamira plans to major in accounting at Jacksonville State University in the fall. She says she plans to use her voice to advocate and educate. Voices for Our Father Scholarship of $2,000 was awarded to Jamira Patrick. Charity Renfro. Charity Renfro is a descendant of Dan Collins. She is a doctoral candidate at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Charity is a former Macon County Junior Miss and plans to use her education and experience to focus on cyberbullying among students at HBCUs to share her experience and help students raise their self-esteem. Voices for Our Father Scholarship of $2,000 goes to Charity Renfro. Congratulations. Our 2024 scholarship committee members are myself, Bishop Deirdre Parker Jackson. I'm the chairperson. My co-chairperson is the esteemed Dr. Kimberly Carr Buford. Without her, I can't do anything, really. One making career coach for Macon County Schools, Dr. Christy Minster. She's a professor. Amy Pack a board member for Voices for Our Fathers, Javenta Vaughn, she's a retired educator, and Barbara Wiggins, she's the past chairperson for the scholarship committee. This concludes our presentation.
got chills again. Let's give a round of applause. We can air hand or we can put up the emoji for these esteemed scholarship recipients. They are off to do some amazing work. And Cassidy, thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts and feelings about being a scholarship recipient. We are very grateful and honored to have you here. And we know that you're going to do great things uh, moving forward with your career. Right now, we will move forward with our annual candle lighting ceremony with Ms. Evella Gaston Mack, Ms. Peggy Tatum, and Ms. Daylene Williams, who are also descendants and a membership co chairs. And before we start, um, I'll, I'll I'll do the memorial service. Let me do the. Is that what we want? I to am do? so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> See, now you keep me on track. You say I keep you on track. You keep me on track. God so. put us together. God put us together. <laughs> but please, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Matthew five sixteen reminds us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. During this annual memorial service, let us pray. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, as we light our candles and watch them glow and see the flames dancing, please let us all know that although the light of the candles flicker out of sight, in our hearts, the love for the 625 men and our ancestors will still burn bright. Oh, Lord. We will not ponder on sadness because they are no longer near. We will think only of joy and gladness because we are still here. Left to lift their voices so their memories forever live on. In every way, remind us that we represent you and them and you call us your own. Continue to grant us with your Holy Spirit, your grace and mercy to travel the 40 year beats and paths that these brave 625 men trailblazed for us to move forward from shame to, and trauma to honor and triumph together until we meet thee, O Lord, at last. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Now we will move forward. Thank you so much, Bishop. Our opening prayer. May we bow our heads, priest. Father God, we come as humble as we can before your throne of grace and mercy. Thanking you for this entire week of day of healing for our and public health ethics intensive conference. Father, thank you that you have healed us from shame and trauma. Now we are living in honor and triumph together. We give you all the glory and all the praises. We bless your holy and your divine name. A word of praise shall continually be in our mouth. Father, we light candles today to remember our 625 brave heroes who went to sit on the right side of your throne some 50 years ago. May you add a blessing to each one of their souls. Thank you, Father, that you have granted a voice in the descendants to continue to speak for them ensuring that what happened to them would never happen again. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ms. Williams, if you are ready, you may speak until Ms. Gaston can come back in. Mm -hmm. You want to go ahead without Evella? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we'll just wait for her to see if she can come back in. Okay. Well, uh, let me just say, 
if she doesn't get back in. I had that same scripture already to say, uh, Bishop, about let your light shine just in case. So with what's been said, we're gonna we want everyone to get a candle. At this time, we're gonna write uh, light a candle for the 625 men that was in the United States Public Health Clifford Study that was so wrongly treated. And we're gonna remember them. We're going to continue to go out and tell the story, even if for those that don't want to hear it, like some people I've been into, tell it anyway, because they're listening. And at this time, light your candle. <laughs> we have a moment. Moment of silence. Amen. Amen. In the meantime, I'd like to uh, speak to my fellow descendant and friend, Dr. Brooks. Uh, I know someone who would be, in addition, I'm sure, to your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents, uh, one of your former teachers would be just so excited about where you are and so proud of you. Uh, Mrs. Magadil Williams, remember? <laughs> remember her? And yeah, that that that's uh, uh, my aunt and uh, my sister Joyce. Yep, that, that's our aunt. And she was a woman who was big on promoting self-esteem, self-confidence and pride and education in all of her students and most importantly in her little nieces and nephews. So I, I saw her speaking in you in one of those little, in one of those little classrooms performances that she would, that she would have uh, uh, her, 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 her students do. And, um, so I, 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 I'm really so happy. And you know, the stories that you told, told about your, your, uh, great grandfather. Now I am going to put you on the spot, uh, because we have been collecting, uh, little stories, little bowels about the men who were in the study to give them the dignity My of their humanity. And we publish them in our biannual newsletter. So what you uh, shared with us today, I would love to have that in our upcoming newsletter. Uh, the something uh, winter and, and, and spring newsletter. It'll Hopefully it'll be out um, in end of uh, July. So if you would be so kind as to send uh, uh, that to me, I would thoroughly appreciate it because that adds to it. And if you have photos of, of, of them, add that to it because we want to showcase their legacies and to put a face with their names and tell their stories. I it's, it's, it's so important. I certainly will. And Ms. Maggie Neal Williams just lives with me, in me, and through me every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, 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 she was an awesome inspirer. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 
So thank you, thank you so much. I so I show uh, thoroughly enjoyed you. And then there's something else I'm going to ask you to participate in with the University uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where we talk to medical students because I think uh, you could could really uh, help with inspiring those first year medical students as well as enhancing and bringing our story more uh, no, alive me. even more. Can you hear me? So thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Y'all can hear me now? Hello? Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize yes. for that. Hello? Hello. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to um, read a poem. Thank you all for being so patient with me, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, I have a poem here from Langston Hughes. I dream a world. I dream a world where, where uh, men... Ms. Gaston, please start your video. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Did it start? Where am I? I thought I did. What? You okay? I'm yeah, you, good. You, you, can you, can see, you can see you in here. We can see you in yeah, here. Okay, Great. Good. All right. okay. I dream a world. A poem by Langston Hughes. I dream a world where man, no other man, will scorn, where love will bless the earth, and peace its past adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl, attends the needs of all mankind, of such I dream my world. And I would like to read a scripture here. Ecclesiastics, it'll be three through seven. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to, to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And I thank each and every one of you for everything um, that you all did here. I missed quite a few of the um, seminars, but Dr. Hodges, I did get the um, AI and it was dynamic. I was able to attend that one, but I, I appreciate everything you guys have done. Okay, did you all hear me? Yes. Huh? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, thank Cole. you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, okay. To our membership co-chairs for leading us in our annual candle lighting ceremony. Next, we will have our benediction by Mr. Clement Jolson. Just one more time to hear President Head's voice and her charge for us as we go forth and continue in 2024. President Head, I'm sorry to, to put you on the spot, but you're such a prolific speaker and I know that you can continue to get us to where we need to be and go. So do you want me to? After Clemens, you just get the, just one final remarks. I know it's not on the program, but I think it will be a nice, close out um and that's no credence um to you cousin <laughs> uh, it's just a payback <laughs> miss head could i say something before you do that yes okay i just like to say also uh to dr brooks uh thank you dr brooks i really enjoy it dr brooks is uh the daughter of my high school classmate and i am so proud of her for her, for, for myself knowing her, and for my classmate because she's no longer with us. Thank, thank you, Miss Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> so now you want the benediction and then Mrs. Head? Thank you. 
We thank you, everyone, Lord God. We come now thanking you for today's celebration. Lord God, we thank you for all those who have taken part in this commemorative program. Lord God, we ask that the words that have come forth was the words of encouragement, and they will, we will not fall faint in our resolve, that we shall continue to do the work of the foundation. Lord God, we ask your Holy Spirit will strengthen us as we move forward. Now, Lord, as we decide to go our several ways, we ask that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord God, we ask all these blessings in your darling son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And amen. 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 And I just like to let you all know, you can see this smile on, on my face. I am just overjoyed and filled with, I'm not going to say pride, but the Holy Spirit's amazing graces because of where we are, what we are doing in the name of Jesus. Because it's not about us. It's about the betterment for all of God's children. So I am so thankful for each of you. And uh, Mr. Clement, I almost call you Mr. Jokes. I almost call you Reverend, but <laughs> I know you're a deacon though in, in the church, but I thank you so much. I want to also thank our teacher, Mr. Ashante Davis, because without him, as they say, most of us old folks would just be out of sorts. And I am one of them and don't, am not ashamed to say it. So thank you so much, Ashante. And to Mr. Glenn Person, thank you so very much. And when we come to Tuskegee, you will definitely be in person on our program. So don't go too far. Uh, we are looking forward to, to uh having for having you there. Tuskegee University visited here in Works, Virginia, where I live a few years ago. My husband and I sponsored the, the uh, Golden Voices. In fact, we sponsored them here for four years, but um, not consecutively, but uh, often. And the first couple of years, Mr. Person was in that. And I tell you, that guy just, I, 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 I just had chills the whole time he was singing. So thank you so very much. And to each of my loving descendants, especially all of you, and for a wonderful evening. I so enjoyed this and I am so grateful and thankful. And I think attorney James has left, but I appreciate her. Thank her for representing Dr. Morris. And I hope I get to uh, meet her and see you again, uh, Dr. Brooks, because we're gonna be in touch. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're <laughs> and Dr. Hodge, you are always know, well, I shouldn't call you Dr. Hodge. I'm trying to be formal. Brother David, little <laughs> brother David. <laughs> Thank you for everything and continue the work that you're doing at the Bioethics Center. I'm so proud of the um, scholarships and I feel so blessed to be in this space and to be serving as I am. Uh, I had no vision at my age that I will be doing the work that I'm doing. But when the Holy Spirit speaks and the good Lord calls you for his purpose, Amen. you have no choice. At least I don't. I have to, I have to listen uh, mm -hmm. to him. So I hope and pray that we will continue to do the work that he has called each of us to do, to bring good from evil, 
to honor those men and their sacrifices and to change the system. What causes medical racism and social racism to all marginalized people. And that includes African-Americans. So thank you all so very much. I love you all dearly and we shall work to move forward from shame and trauma to triumph and honor together. Thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. God bless.